recording and then I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see my uh, presentation. And just so you know, I'm not going to be able to see your chat while I'm presenting. It's just the technological limitations of screen share. Um, but uh, hopefully we will we will get through this just fine. One, one second here. All right, I should be sharing my screen. Um, I hope everyone can see this. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and start my presentation. Here we go. Great. Okay, so if you're with us here today, it's because your student uh, has been put on the wait list or maybe you yourself has been put on the wait list and you want to know what to do. Um, obviously, we can't talk about uh, the wait list or college without also addressing the fact that we're all in self quarantine in our homes and school does not look anything like school used to and who knows what college is going to look like in the fall. So um, I am going to go through kind of our standard presentation our standard advice for what should students should do if they've been waitlisted, but I'm going to add in some pieces um, that are new considerations given the COVID-19 situation. So I hope that I can um, predict some of your questions and, and some of the predicaments that you find yourself in and give you some useful advice. Um, so the main gist of my presentation today is what to do and of course what not to do if you've been waitlisted um, in order to help your chances of getting off the waitlist, um, but also to just help your student move forward with uh, their lives, uh, with their college process, because they've been waiting for so long, and then to be put on a wait list just extends the waiting. Um, so I wanna give you some practical advice uh, for how to get through this whole, this whole waiting game. So these are the topics I really wanna to cover today. What is the wait list? Why do colleges use it? What, you know, what is it there for? Um, what purpose does it serve? Um, why were you or your student waitlisted? Uh, there are several possible reasons. It's hard to know exactly why, but I wanna cover a couple of the big ones. Um, and then what should you do next um, to manage this process? So what's a wait list for anyway? Now, before we can really get into the uh, nuts and bolts of what a waitlist is for, we have to define some key terms here. So the first one I want to talk about is yield. Um, yield is the number of students who accept offers of admission. So let's say you're a college and you send out 100 acceptance letters and only 50 students decide to enroll. That means you have a 50% yield. 50% of uh, the people you accepted actually accepted your acceptance. Um, and this number is extremely important to colleges for a lot of reasons, um, but at the most basic level, it's money. Um, so understanding a college's yield helps that college plan for the future. Um, they will know how many acceptances they need to send out to get the right number of students to start the next fall. Um, and you wanna remember that the only source of income in a college is tuition, is the admissions office bringing in students. So they have to have the right number of freshmen in the fall to meet their budget um, and uh, meet their projections and have enough money to pay their professors or even hold enough classes. Um, so they want a specific number and it's usually, you know, a very specific number. They want you know, 1,012 students or something like that, um, because they know that's what they're going to need to be able to operate that year. And so yield changes from year to year, depending on a number of different factors. But colleges use very sophisticated software to be able to predict their yield using their historical data, using the behavior of, you know, student applicants and, and people who are browsing their website even, uh, to be able to predict their yield. And if they get it wrong, then they're in trouble. Right? If they don't get enough students, they send out their 100 acceptances and only 20 students accept, then they've got a gap of 30 students, 30 tuitions, that represents a good amount of money, that they need to make up somewhere. They need to make up that number. So you can probably guess, they pull that number from the wait list. Um, if they get their yield wrong, um, on the other side, if they underestimated, they sent out 100 acceptances and then they have 80 students accept, they're also in, in a little bit of trouble because they might not have enough housing, uh, seats in the classroom, you know, professors to teach enough sections for the intro English class or whatever it is. Um, so it's a different kind of problem. It's a problem they much would 
much rather be in because it's not a shortfall of cash, um, but it still presents a logistical challenge for the college. So that's why they're really trying to um, protect their yield and, and keep it stable from year to year. Um, and one tool they can use to overcome shortfalls um, is the wait list. Um, with that other situation I just threw out there that they might have more students than, than they need. Um, many schools, we've seen this in the past, will ask students to join at the January semester, or they will say, actually we'll fund you if you want to take a gap year here's some money um and that way that student gets put into the next year's class and they bring down their uh enrollment numbers for for the current year so um yield is a very complicated topic it also plays a role in u.s news rankings and several other types of rankings um so the higher the yield often the higher the ranking for the college and this also plays into selectivity so if a if a college has a really good yield, a very high yield number, they can be more selective. So for example, let's say you're college B now, and you have something like a 80% yield. That's an amazing yield. Harvard has something like 79 or 80% right now. Um, so um, really good schools tend to have, or schools that are perceived as really good, let me say that, tend to have very high yields. Um, and they can be more selective because Harvard can basically count on their 80% every year. So they know exactly how many acceptances to send out um, and they don't have to accept more than they really need. So they can afford to accept their 1600, usually as their freshman class, their 1600 freshmen out of their thousands and thousands of applications and they can remain confident that they're gonna hit their yield numbers and have the budget they need and, and the enrollment numbers that they need. Um, schools with a lower yield uh, can't be as selective. They need a little bit more buffer in there in order to hit their enrollment numbers. Um, so uh, if you have a good yield, you can be more selective. Um, and that selectivity, um, I'm sure you've seen it here, but uh, the definition of selectivity is really that admissions rate. How many acceptances divided by how many applications the college got. Um, and these two things, yield and selectivity both play into rankings, um, actually numerically figure into the US news rankings, which are the most popular and frankly, the most useless uh, rankings that are out there. Um, if you want more information on why rankings are, are useless, put your name in the chat and I'll send you an article from the New Yorker about this that lays it out really well. Um, but um, these two things, yield and selectivity, not only play into rankings, they also play into just society's perception of the quality of a school or the desirability of a school. So if you hear that, um, you know, college C, let's say, has a yield of 90% and a selectivity of 3%, you're starting to think, wow, that, that must be a really rigorous school, a really, really, um, competitive school to get into. So it must be really good. People are clamoring to get in. And if they get in, they're definitely going They have such a high yield number. So um, all of this kind of plays into our perceptions of a school's quality, their um, reputation, their prestige. Um, and of course, colleges love that. They want to be seen as prestigious and selective and um, uh, desirable um, because that helps them get more applications the next year, better students, um, you know, more attention from the media. Um, a lot of really good things come out of that for colleges, um, but it's almost like marketing. Um, they are marketing themselves to future generations of applicants through their decisions on this year's class this year's applicants, you know, their yield numbers and their selectivity numbers are signaling something to future generations who are going to apply. Um, so you, all of this is good context because it shows you that the admissions process is far broader than just one student's grades or SAT scores or their recommendation letter or anything personal about that student. There's a, a much larger system uh, that is working behind the scenes to encourage these certain trends. Um, now, to get to the question of our entire presentation here, what is a waitlist for? Well, waitlist helps the school manage these things. Um, if they have fallen low on their yield, if they find out come May 1st or June 1st, as it is with some colleges this year, that 
fewer students than they expected are going to, uh, are planning to attend, we'll send them a deposit so that they indicate their attendance in the fall, then colleges start pulling from their wait list. So the wait list is really a pool of backup students um, that colleges use to reach their enrollment goals. Um, and there is historical data on this. We'll talk about this in a little bit. And you can actually see how many people have been waitlisted and how many people have been accepted off of certain waitlisted in years past. But that does change from year to year, um, depending on you know, the applications they get and what those students decide to do. So let's dig into this. Oh, before we dig into this, um, you know, I've been talking about rankings a little bit. Um, rankings drive many administrative decisions that may not always be in the best interests of families and students and, and may work against your particular student, unfortunately. Um, this comes back to the admissions office being the main source of income for a college. Um, and the deans of admission are balancing multiple priorities, priorities that include, um, you know, who are my big donors? Um, what do we need to do demographically? with our population? Do we need more women than men this year or the other way around? Or do we need more students from the South so that we have geographic diversity in our Northeastern school? Or do we want more or fewer international students? Um, depending on you know, what's happened in years past, um, there are all sorts of priorities that deans of admissions are, are working to balance, including they want the best students for their school, the best fit students for their school. Um, but they've, they've always got these rankings and yield and selectivity in the back of their mind. So why were you waitlisted? Why, were your, why was your student waitlisted? Now, we'll never know for sure because colleges um, usually will not tell you uh, why you were waitlisted. Um, but these are some of the main reasons, the big reasons we've seen. Um, so the top one is the college thinks you will go somewhere else. Um, this is a key strategy for protecting their yield. They don't want to waste an acceptance on someone they think is probably aiming for a higher caliber school. Um, or more rigorous school. So um, people talk about this as the Tufts syndrome, which I think is a little bit unfair to Tufts. Um, but the, the kind of urban legend goes that uh, a lot of Harvard applicants also apply to Tufts as sort of a backup school. And Tufts started having a chip on its shoulder, um, seeing all these very talented applicants um, and assuming that they have also applied to Harvard and assuming that they've also gotten into Harvard and thinking they're going to choose Harvard over Tufts. So they don't want to waste an acceptance on a student like that. So in some cases, they will waitlist a student. Um, and of course, there's no evidence that Tufts actually does this. Um, but that's kind of one of the names that's that's developed in the college admissions world. So uh, if the college thinks you might go somewhere else and that you know, they are just your safety. Um, they may not want to waste an acceptance on you if they are really trying to protect their yield. Another reason is that your profile may not be among the priorities this year. One really good example of this I've seen is um, with um, student musicians who are looking to join the school marching band, let's say, or the or the orchestra. Um, you've got uh, the musical director talking to the admissions office saying, you know, all of my bassoons are graduating next year. I'm going to need some more bassoons in my lineup here. Um, but meanwhile, they've got, you know, 15 clarinets uh, who are app applying this year. And, you know, the band leader knows they've got clarinets in their junior and, and sophomore and even their freshman class. So they, they don't need any more clarinets to kind of fill that bench. They need bassoons. Um, so maybe you're a really talented clarinet pair, player who otherwise looks like an amazing fit for the school um, is, is not actually one of the priorities that year. And so a bassoon player with maybe slightly lower stats or a worse teacher recommendation or something like that might edge the clarinet player out. So, of course, it's a completely um, made up scenario, but I think it's very illustrative of, of how those kind of priorities work. Same thing goes for sports teams or um, different types of majors. If, you know, there's no student in a certain major one year, um, that becomes a priority. If they want to keep that department alive, they're going to need students who have an expressed interest in a particular major. Um, and so students who are, you know, indicating on their application that they want to study Near Eastern languages and civilizations uh, might take priority over, 
a pre-med or an English major, which are typically very popular majors. I use that as an example because I was a Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations major and I was the only one my year at Harvard. Um, and I'm quite sure that had something to do with me getting in. Um, competition may have been tough. It usually is. It's getting harder and harder every year. And maybe, um, you know, your, your student is a really talented student and seems qualified to attend the university, but for whatever reason, they just went with another student. Um, in some cases, students were really just on the cusp. You know, it could have been um, the next vote in the in the admissions committee meeting that they were going to let you in, but actually the the three files that got read before yours actually made it in before you did. So maybe you were just right there, but didn't it didn't happen? Um, but they put you on the wait list because they did like you. Um, financial need may have been a factor. Unfortunately, for some schools that are not need blind, um, financial need might put a student on the wait list instead of on the acceptance list. Um, and then finally, it may be a soft letdown to either you, your family, or your school. We've seen this before. Um, you know, a college may have a really great relationship with um, the college advisor at a high school uh, and instead of rejecting a student they may waitlist a student just to be kind of nice um, or maybe you have a brother who is at a certain school um, and you've applied to that same school and they feel bad rejecting you because your brother's there and you're a good student so they might just put you on the waitlist so um, again uh, admissions officers are not saying this officially um, but uh, kind of in off the record conversations we've heard about this so those are the main reasons a student might be waitlisted. Of course, again, we will never know for sure. Um, but one of the points that I wanna drive home here is it's not really personal. It's not about uh, rejecting a student because if they're waitlisting you, then it means that they think you're qualified. It's just not about, it's about not having space for that particular student right now. Um, and that may change over the coming months as they see who is actually going to attend. So now we get to talk about what do you do if you have been waitlisted? Do you just wait? Um, and the simple answer is no. Um, first, you've got to do a little self-reflection and work uh, within the family. And then you've got to do something to interact with the school. So the first thing students need to do if they've been waitlisted is to figure out their actual top choice among the places they've been accepted. Um, and you'll see in a minute, I'm gonna advise that you treat a waitlist decision like a rejection. Um, just kind of keep it out of your mind and don't hold out hope and be really practical and think about, okay, these are the colleges that have said they want me, they may have offered me some money. Um, you know, students should get really excited about what they actually have in hand um, and figure out where they will uh, deposit among those acceptances. Um, you'll need to also find out how the waitlist affects your housing options and financial aid, ab aid availability because that may change whether you want to stay on the waitlist or not. Um, you may get last choice for housing or there may not be any money available um, if you are accepted off the waitlist. Um, and that may mean the school is no longer attractive to you or to your family. Um, so that's important information for you to know. Um, once you have figured out these things, then students should make a deposit at one acceptance and fully plan on attending that school in the fall. Um, and then accept their spot on one waitlist if there are multiple waitlist decisions and decline the rest. Um, and that's really just to um, stop students from being stuck in this waiting game, this limbo. Um, really just make one promise. I, you know, I'm, I like this school better than this other school I've actually been accepted at. I'm going to stay on this wait list, but I'm going to let the other ones go. Um, not only does that help the student kind of manage their emotions and expectations around wait lists and, you know, uncertainty, um, especially in this climate, there's a lot of uncertainty. It also opens up spots for other students who may really want to go to that school that your student is not that excited about. Um, and so we need to move away from seeing these acceptances as a war 
rewards. I know my parents did that when I got into college. You know, I knew that I was going to go to Harvard early, um, but they still made me file all of my regular applications. And then when I got those acceptance letters, they framed them and put them up at my graduation party. Um, so I know that this is a real thing. There's a lot of pride in saying, oh, my student got into all of these amazing schools. Um, but staying on the wait list at, at any of these schools should not be part of that process. Certainly celebrate all the acceptances that your student does have, but staying on multiple wait lists, going through this wait list appeal process for multiple schools is really kind of um, turmoil for the students because they only have to keep waiting and they don't let themselves get excited about the school that they've actually deposited at. So I really recommend making a deposit only at one acceptance, of course, um, and then keeping one wait list spot. If there is a school that has waitlisted you that is actually better than the acceptances that that you have. And when I say better, I mean a better fit for the student, not there's no objective measure of better when it comes to colleges. Um, all right, so once you've done that kind of reflection and decision making process, then with the college that you've been waitlisted at, you need to follow their instructions. So most of them will say you need to accept your position on the waitlist by this date by doing X, Y, or Z. You either need to send them an email, click a button, uh, log into their portal and do something. So make sure you follow the college's instructions to a T uh, and be very timely about this and pay attention to any deadlines they may have. Um, some colleges will say we don't want to hear from you besides you letting us know whether you want to stay on the wait list or not. Um, that's a little more rare. Um, many colleges will provide a form that says, you know, feel free to give us any updates here, or now you have to write this other essay. I have a student who's been waitlisted at UC Davis, and I just helped him uh, put this sort of letter together for them. They asked for a 200 word essay about why Davis is the best place for him to continue his education after high school. Um, so many schools will allow for this letter. Some of them even will require it. Um, and we'll come back to the details of this letter in just a second before we move on from the slide. Um, but it's also very important for students to keep on keeping on. They got to keep their grades up. They've got to stay engaged with school, engaged with their teachers. Um, they can't get into trouble. Um, they got to keep their social media profiles clean. Um, they should continue being the good student they have always been um, and not let senior, um, senior spring, senioritis get to them um, or this, you know, this COVID-19 ennui that, that all the students are feeling because, you know, classes have gone past fail and it's online instruction. It is a very challenging situation, but students really need to stay engaged. Um, and if appropriate, there are some cases where this is appropriate, um, you can talk to your college counselor at high school to see if they have a personal relationship with anyone in the admissions office, they may be able to advocate for you. Um, but, um, this is a really tricky situation. Um, counselors are often uncomfortable with this. So you kind of have to approach it very carefully. Um, if you have questions about whether it's appropriate for your student, please talk to me individually and I can, I can give you my best advice. Um, but back to this letter. This letter um, needs to hit a couple of key points. The biggest one is that you will attend if accepted. That could be the first sentence, it could be the last sentence, it needs to be in this letter. Uh, the letter should be no longer than a page. I usually have students aim for half a page. If it ends up being three quarters of a page, double space, that's fine. Um, but it's really not a lengthy letter. Um, now you want to remember they have your application and all of your essays. They think you're qualified if you're on the wait list. So you don't need to prove or rehash any of that stuff again, right? So don't talk about your grades or your test scores or anything they already know from your application. Instead, focus on the more personal qualities that make you a good fit for the school. So this could include some sort of achievement or experience that you've had since you applied that they don't have information out, um, but you should be talking about that experience or achievement in a way that reflects on your growth your values, who you are as a person, or what you're excited about for the future. And you should always try to tie those things to something at the school. 
So I often have students do a little bit more school research or revisit their school research from when we put together their college list of what were the things that really excited you about this school? What did you say in your essays to this school already? What else could you say um, to show them how excited you are about the school and why you truly believe they're the best fit for you? Um, if you're interested, I do have some sample letters that I can share with you. Um, and of course, uh, we do this kind of work with students all the time. So if, if you'd like your student to do this work with us, just let me know. I know many of you um, already work with us. So, um, you know, it'd be very easy for us to just have you get in touch with your consultant again and uh, work on that letter with the student. So this is where I want to give you a reality check. Um, students should really treat the wait list like a rejection. Um, it might be painful for them. Uh, it is also very common for students to start comparing themselves to other kids. You know, oh, this person got in and I got waitlisted. What does that mean? Are they better than me? Um, and that's really hard. And I know that students take this very personally. Um, they really shouldn't because it's, as I've shown you, it's usually not a personal, uh, it's not anything affected by their personal uh, situation. It's really about the college's priorities. And those two things just may not be aligned this year. Um, so students really should try to move on and actually instead of, you know, holding out hope for the school that is their dream school, if they've waitlisted them, they should really try to get excited about the other schools that have accepted them and then, you know, do what's necessary to stay on a waitlist if they really want to. Um, but they've got to move on because uh, they've been at this for so long. Um, they should really start investing in a vision for the future that is more likely than a wait list because wait list acceptances are very, very low. Now across the board, across the 7,000 colleges and universities in the United States, about 25% of people who are waitlisted actually do get in. But at highly selective colleges, it's usually between zero and 4%. And this changes all the time. So some schools uh, may accept zero people one year, five people the next year, and 100 people the following year. Um, it's, it's very difficult to, to predict. Um, this data is available, and um, I, I could tell you where to get it. I think that's on the, the next slide here, yeah. So get some perspective if, if your student is really hanging on, oh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll get on that wait list or get off that wait list. Um, do your research. So you can just Google wait list and the name of your school um, and usually Google will give you the data you're looking for. You can also go to bigfuture.collegeboard.com, look up the school, and then they actually will give you some waitlist information as well. I have another resource that I can share with um, the attendees of this, um, of this webinar that ha has been tracking uh, waitlist acceptances since 2017. Um, now you wanna keep in mind, not every school publishes this data. The government doesn't require colleges to release this data. So some schools don't release it, but some schools do. Um, and you can get a sense from looking at it, which schools really rely on their waitlist. They're accepting hundreds of kids off the waitlist every year, or which schools really don't use it. They accept maybe one or two students every year. Um, and hopefully that can help you and your student get some perspective on what is actually likely here. Um, so I encourage you to do that research um, and, and think about moving on and getting excited about that acceptance instead of holding out hope for a wait list. Um, once your student is really excited about something, you know, give them some time to process all of this, especially in this climate, I think it's gonna be pretty challenging. Um, you know, it's an, an emotional blow in an already emotionally heightened time. Um, so give them some time to process this. But sometime before the first week of May, your student should write a letter to one college that they've been waitlisted at. And, and again, please just one. Um, and as I mentioned, that letter should hit a couple keynotes. So there is a siren going by me. I'm just gonna mute myself. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so those keynotes again are, I will attend if I'm accepted. Here are the things that are new with me, you know, accomplishments or achievements that they have not heard about before. And this is um, kind of my reflection on those achievements or experiences in terms of values, growth, uh, expectations for the future, and why I'm a fit for your school. 
Um, then ongoing, your students really need to keep their profiles spick and span. So if they're trying to prove to a college that you, they belong there, being a lazy senior is not the right way to do it. Um, and again, I know that right now it's very hard for a lot of students to stay motivated, um, but grades need to stay up if your school is still giving grades this, uh, this quarter or this semester. Um, they better pass if it's pass fail. Um, exams still matter. Um, so for those of you who have students who are doing the AP exams, you know, there's a lot of controversy about whether this is a valid instrument or not. The, the um, adjusted format of the AP test on your phone or home computer. Um, but uh, students should really strive to do their best on those things. And there are resources to help them prepare. If you need help with that, let me know. Um, keeping some kind of um, structure to their day will be helpful for all of this. They need to stay engaged with their teachers, engage with their college counselor, um, engage with their peers really, um, and try to keep up all of the things, the intellectual activities or even extracurricular activities that they can in this climate. Um, of course, colleges are going to be really understanding um, because this is affecting everybody across the world, um, but we really don't want our top students to turn into couch potatoes in the you know last couple of weeks of, of the school year. So um, make sure they they understand that this is really important. Um, even for the colleges they've been accepted at, um, I've seen offers rescinded because of, you know, they've gotten in trouble or something they posted on social media or what have you. So it's really, really important for the wait list, but also for the acceptances. So um, make sure they, they keep it together. Um, and here are some don'ts. Um, don't call and yell at the admissions offices. Don't try to bribe them. Don't tell multiple schools they are your number one choice. Um, don't rant about acceptances or wait lists or rejections on social media because colleges are tracking that. Um, don't overdo it with extra materials, calls, emails, or cookies. Um, the one letter, um, usually the college will tell you how to submit it or whom to submit it to, um, or they'll give you a form. That's enough. You do not need to do more than that. Don't send extra essays or portfolios or anything like that unless the college has requested it. Um, don't mention your other acceptances. Don't use those as leverage. That is just really kind of distasteful to colleges. Um, don't show up uninvited at accepted students events. Don't have an alum or a big wig make a call for you. That's also kind of looked down upon. Um, and don't force your counselor to call on your behalf. As I said, in some situations, it may be appropriate for a counselor to reach out. Um, but if the counselor is expressing any kind of hesitation and you try to force them, if they do reach out, uh, it's likely that they will do so with some, um, some feelings <laughs> and you don't want those feelings to be communicated to the admissions office. So um, just be aware that everything you do now could possibly impact you getting off that wait list. So you have to be on your best behavior in all senses of that. And then you wait uh, and try your best to keep calm and carry on and get excited about where you're going. Um, celebrate those acceptances, spend time with your kids and with your family, um, because hopefully if school is back on campus in the fall, they will be leaving soon. Um, and uh, we encourage um, seniors to start sharing their wisdom with younger students um, as well, so they can help them have some perspective about this process and, and help them have, a, have an easy, easy time of it. Um, so that's my presentation. I'm going to stop my screen share now and I'm going to open this up for questions. I know that I've gotten a bunch of chats. Um, so let's see here. Um, okay, so a number of people have mentioned they want to see the article on wait lists. Um, excuse me, the article on ranking. So I will send that around and also the sample letters. I'll make sure that that goes around um, as well as the there's actually a Google spreadsheet that has the waitlist tracking from past years all in one place. So I'll make sure all of that gets sent around to everyone who's registered for, for this uh, webinar. Um, any other questions about you know, the letter, what to do, or how colleges use waitlists? Well, that seems like- Hi. Hi. 
Yes, um, this is Kimberly Kirk. I had a question for you. Sure. Um, so I, my daughter applied and she's been waitlisted at the college I attended. Oh, okay. And we had a ton of legacy. I mean, myself, my, my two sisters-in-law also attended. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we were very disappointed. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it inappropriate for me to call my alumni association just to ask about the process? Uh, not intervention, but to ask the process. Right. I mean, if you're calling the alumni association, I don't think that that could hurt unless, um, unless you're impolite with them. Um, but uh, oftentimes they don't really have more information to give you. Um, but I don't think that that could hurt if you are tactful about it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have one more. So if, yeah, if the college has a form, then that is in lieu of a letter then? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So I am putting, I just got a question via chat and I will answer it. I'm putting my email in the chat. Um, it's just Sheila at signeteducation.com. And uh, if you have questions, um, feel free, questions you don't want to ask right now, um, feel free to email me at any point over the next couple of weeks. I'm always happy to help. Um, and um, to get to a couple of the questions here, one of the big ones is how is COVID going to affect all of this? Nobody knows. It's so crazy. Um, it's strange to say that I feel like I can speak with more certainty about juniors applying next year um, than I can about what happens with wait lists because of COVID-19. So everyone is sort of expecting enrollment numbers to drop. So even if they were accepted and most colleges sent out their acceptance letters or made their acceptance decisions, before the US was really taking COVID-19 seriously and we had schools, colleges and, and high schools kind of shutting down. Um, that was in mid-March and most decisions came out right around then. Um, so um, it's fair to assume that fewer international students will come to the US. So that opens up some spots. Um, it is also fair to assume that fewer people may want to start college in the fall if COVID-19 is still a problem and we need to continue social distancing in the way that we are currently, meaning colleges will have online classes. Um, I've read articles about colleges thinking about delaying their fall semester. So a college wouldn't even start in August or September when it normally does, um, but may start later, um, or they may not have a fall semester, or they may just do it online in the way they're doing now, hopefully with a little bit more kind of foresight and organization than, than they're doing it now. Um, so all of these things could really affect whether students decide, students who are accepted, decide to go at all to that college or take a gap year instead. Um, I'm having a lot of conversations with parents about, you know, these are juniors who are thinking about applying next fall. Should they be thinking about a gap year instead of college if college is online? Um, my response is, well, if college is online, what do you think you can do in your gap year? Um, because if college is online, that probably means you can't get a job, you can't get an internship, you can't work in a lab, you probably can't travel. Um, so those are a lot of the things that people do in their gap years. Um, now, there are a lot of students who may have a great idea for a gap year instead, like maybe they're going to write a book or do some sort of artistic project or something that can't really be limited by um, the coronavirus outbreak. Um, but uh, there's just a lot of uncertainty around this. So, you know, there are some factors that are going to drive enrollment down, which might bode well for the wait list. Then again, if the colleges decide to delay their fall semester um, or even reduce their offerings, um, they may not be pulling from the wait list because maybe they want fewer students. So all a big question mark, and I'm sorry, I don't have more concrete answers. Of course, um, you know, we're tracking the situation very, very closely. Um, there's a new announcement almost every day from some college or the college board or the ACT. And, um, you know, we're, we're uh, processing all of this information and sharing, sharing updates with 
um, with our clients and through our newsletters. Um, so if you'd like to be kept in the loop about any of these things, please let me know, put, put your name in the chat and I can make sure to, to keep you updated anytime I hear anything about uh, what's gonna happen with wait lists because of coronavirus or fall uh, start of semester because of, of coronavirus. Great. Any other questions? Okay, well, I guess that's it. I hope to hear from you and I wish you all the best of luck with your acceptances, your wait lists and the coronavirus situation. I hope everyone is staying safe and sane. Um, and uh, please reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, -bye everybody. Thank you. Bye.